Good morning and welcome to Life Church, where faith is a journey, not a guilt trip. My name is John and it is a privilege, it's an honor to be with you both online, Life or Nation, and here in person at Life Church. This is hope, this is home. Every weekend we have new faces, guests discovering the Life Church difference, both online and right here in person. And man, my heart is, I would love to connect with you. If I could, I would take you all out for ice cream afterwards. I really would. But you know, there's kids running around in the lobby. It's hard to connect on Sundays with the hustle and bustle. So I need you all to do me a favor. Pull out your smartphones and log on to connecttolifechurch.com. If you're new here or you come once or twice, you're just kind of kicking the tires, I want to connect with you. Connecttolifechurch.com takes 30 seconds to connect up. And listen, if you're here in person, you could even just grab this, a blue connection card. It should have been on your seat when you arrived today. Fill this puppy out. Later, after the worship experience, when we're dismissed, head on out to the front lobby. I'll be out there. I'd love to say hi. I'll do knuckles because, you know, COVID. But turn in your completed connection card to receive a free gift. We call it a Life Church swag bag. It's chock full of goodies, plus more information on this new church you've discovered. So fill out your connection card, drop it off in the front lobby on the way out to receive your swag bag. Or if you're a little shy or online, go to connecttolifechurch.com. Either way, we are thrilled that you are here at Life Church. Who the f did I marry? Hey, Life Church, how are we doing today? You guys feeling good? Yeah? You're saving the energy for the Lions game later. That's what you're doing. Uh, you're de t voting it right now. I know you're going to watch it later. Uh, my name is John. And good news, you are in a safe space. You're in a place where everyone here has blown it. And it's okay because we are all rough drafts of the person we are becoming. So you can relax, sit back as we dive into God's word together. I was out in the front lobby earlier, and a kid came up to me and took one look at my outfit and said, I didn't know you were a zookeeper. Oh. So, uh, yeah, I'm feeling really great right now. On your seats are invite cards, jumbo invite cards to our series, Who the Bleep Did I Marry? You should take some of these home and put them in the mailbox. Just slap a stamp and your neighbor's address and mail it out to your neighbor, or take it to your break room at work, post it up, take it to the library, post it up, uh, wherever, because wouldn't it be fun to fill up those seats next to you next Sunday and see what God can do through you. So grab one, grab a hundred of these invite cards and get them out so that we can reach more people. Hey, at the end of the month, we're gonna wrap up this series with a live Q&A via text messaging. So on the last Sunday of this month, we're going to wrap it up. You'll get to texting, relationship advice questions. And as the questions show up live, I'll give it a shot. I'll try to take you into the scriptures and give you some advice for navigating things. Because we all need relationship advice. Whether we're single, married, divorced, or it's complicated, every one of us has questions. And we want to help you make better decisions and have fewer regrets. That's why today's message is part one of a two-part message. So you got to come back next Sunday to get the rest of it. We're going to be talking about repairing a broken relationship. Think about it. We've all had broken relationships. Maybe you had uh, a tiff with a family member. Perhaps you were at work and you have a broken relationship with a coworker, or, or maybe in your love life, things haven't always been hunky-dory, they lived happily ever after. In fact, you should watch, stop watching Disney films, they always lie to you at the end. They always say she lived happily ever after. 
No, I promise you, Snow White got divorced. So uh, we're going to talk about repairing a broken relationship, part one of two today. There's fill in the blank notes on the Life Michigan app. You can get that just by searching Life Michigan in any app store so you can follow along. So here is the truth. Nobody feels good about conflict. When you have a disagreement, when we have a wedding ceremony, I've said this before, you have one sinner, another sinner, and they come together in marriage and produce lots of sin. There's going to be fireworks. There's going to be conflict. And my goal today is to help you take baby steps forward in conflict, but nobody feels good about conflict because we don't want to hurt the other person. So hopefully through today's message and next Sunday, we're going to be able to walk through how do we repair those relationships without slamming someone. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, if there's a disagreement between you and somebody else, you who live by the Spirit, so if you follow Jesus, then you live by the Spirit. The Spirit of God is within you, to seal you, to protect you, to guide you. You should restore that person gently. So God says, I want you to walk toward people, not away. We would rather shrink away because it's very uncomfortable to engage when there's conflict. You could be at Walmart, you're just going through shopping, getting your donuts, getting your milk, and then you'll see out of the corner of your eye that person that you haven't talked to in months and months and months because they ghosted you and they unfriended you on Facebook and you see them out of the corner of your eye and you've got a decision to make. And a lot of us will honestly, we'll, we'll try to duck underneath the shopping cart and then we'll just kind of move into the next aisle, right? It, we'll play Frogger at the shopping mart because we don't want to run into that person that we have an unresolved conflict with. But, but the scriptures say that if there's a disagreement, then you who are led by the Spirit, your flesh wants to lead you away. Your Spirit, though, the Spirit of God is going to lead you toward the person, right? Right? We want to restore that relationship gently. But that's hard when there's a lot of emotions involved. You ever gotten you know, angry at someone? You just disagree with something that the teacher was talking about? You just couldn't stand it? Or you had your Thanksgiving meal. And everybody's having their pumpkin pie. And then that weird uncle that you only see every other year speaks up about politics, and everybody gets upset around the table. Yeah, there's always a lot of anger involved with conflict. Hurt turns to anger, because anger numbs pain. It, it sounds like something Yoda would say. Hurt turns to anger, right? <laughs> when you get wounded by somebody, when you are hurt by their words or by their actions, or maybe they're ignoring you, they're in action. You will try to numb the pain through anger. There's some biochemical things that happen in the body when you get angry. Different chemicals and hormones are released that help to numb the hurt. That's why you get angry. Anger is smoke. The fire is something deeper. That's why in any disagreement... You want to get past the anger in the other person and figure out what is the root issue. What's the real issue that they're feeling hurt about? Or maybe there's a gap in their information. Remember last week we talked about how there'll always be times when you don't have all the information about another person. There's a gap, and you can fill that gap with gossip or gospel. Gossip is, oh, I think this is what's really going on. Boy, I, I bet there's another piece of the story, and it's horrible, right? It's just kind of filling it in with innuendo. Gospel is to fill it with truth. 
to say, I don't have the whole story, so I'm going to go to the person and find out what is missing between me and them. I'm going to fill it with truth, not with falsehood. When we're hurt, we will lash out like an animal. So uh, I've got two dogs. One is a little wiener dog named Chewy. He's a long-haired dachshund. So he looks like Chewbacca from Star Wars. He's Chewy. Then in January, we got a big old golden doodle. You ever seen a golden doodle? Like these big floppy muppets. He looks like one of the characters from the old 1980s movie Labyrinth. You know, that was a deep cut, right? And uh, her name is, um, uh, not Golden Doodle, it's uh, Molly. And Molly has been chewing at her foot. I know, weird, right? Like, we noticed this just yesterday that she's been, like, you know, bugging her rear right foot, and she chewed off all the fur. I'm going to show you a picture of her right now. No, I'm not. Uh, it's like she's angry at something, and, and so she's trying to numb the pain of whatever it is. I don't know what the deeper issue is. We're going to take it to the vet this week and get it all checked out. Probably put the tone of shame on her. You know, what? wouldn't you love to put that on your kids sometime? Just send them to school and call them shame. Something's going on with Molly, the Wonder Dog, and so she's trying to numb the pain. That's why sometimes when we're in pain, we will do self harm. Right? We'll either throw a pity party, that's a form of self-harm, or you may cut yourself, that's a form of self-harm. Those are all bad ideas. Sometimes you need to go see a counselor or a therapist. There is nothing wrong with going to see a counselor or a therapist. If you cut off your arm, and it was just like <laughs> spurting blood everywhere, would you just put a band-aid on it and just say, oh, I'll just pray it away. I'll pray away the pain. No! Hello, McFly. You go to the ER. It's an emergency. You get help from someone who can help you. The same is true with emotional pain. You and I are going to go through trauma in life. And when that happens, go see a good, licensed Christian counselor. If you don't know who to go see, just tap my shoulder in the front lobby later. I'll give you a list of names. Sometimes you need to go see a professional, and that is okay, and they will help guide you through the brokenness in a relationship. Now, if there's abuse, or if there is um, something that's leading you into sin in a relationship, this message does not apply to you, all right? You need to set up healthy boundaries if it's an issue of abuse or someone leading you into sin. But for anything else that's just broken in the relationship, let's figure out how to repair it. Let me show you this next slide. Here's what happens. My right to be treated right is violated. This girl that I really cared about just broke my heart. She has violated the way that I deserve to be treated because I'm a prince and I'm a king and I should be treated well. Right? Or, or maybe you're, you've grown up and you're, you have parents who are getting older and they have violated, they've intruded into your privacy in some way. So there's a breakdown of trust. Whatever it is, when there's relational fireworks, my right to be treated right is violated. And so I can respond in one of two ways. I've got two choices. I've got the law of the jungle or the law of Jesus. The law of the jungle is our flesh. It's what we see lived out on the news. Oh my goodness. Just turn on the news and see what's happening in the Middle East right now. That is all law of the jungle. That's responding with hostility and harshness. That's fighting against the person instead of fighting for the person. The law of the jungle is what we see on our favorite TV shows, whether it's Gilmore Girls or the TV show Survivor. The law of the jungle is you hit me, I hit back. It's harshness. It's hostility. It's how we, um, many times, how we grow up. This is modeled to us on the school playground. A lot of us, it's modeled in our family of origin. 
You saw mom and dad fighting each other. Instead of fighting for the relationship, they're fighting in the relationship. That's the law of the jungle. That's a closed fist. Many of us respond with the law of the jungle. This is just natural. This is what comes naturally to us. What comes supernaturally is the law of Jesus, who in Matthew 5 says, blessed are the meek. Meekness is the opposite of harshness. Meekness is strength under control. Meekness does not come naturally to us. It's not modeled on Netflix. But it is modeled by Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, it says that Jesus stepped out of the splendor of heaven and became like a humble servant, stepping into our creation. That's meekness. That's strength and power under control. On his way to the cross, as Jesus is carrying that heaving lumber on his back, people are jeering, spitting, ripping out his beard. Does Jesus fight back? No. He rejects the law of the jungle and instead shows us the way of Jesus, which is meekness. He begins to pray. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So if you're looking for a prayer in the midst of fireworks in your life, echo the words of Christ. Say, Father, forgive her. Father, forgive him. He doesn't understand what he's doing to me. That's taking your problem and bringing it to the Lord. And you're going to be tempted to go to the law of the jungle, to fight back, to hold a grudge. But Jesus never held a grudge. He only ever held out his hand. The law of Jesus is meekness. And as you read the scriptures, you get into God's word, and God's word gets into you, you will become more meek. You can bring your strength under control. You can heal that pain when you realize it's really not about you. Nine times out of ten, if it's hysterical, it's historical. There's something else in that person's past, and you just happen to flip a switch that brought back unhealed pain from the past, you're just a convenient target. And if you can take the spotlight off of yourself and depersonalize, that is a really quick pathway to meekness. Praying, Lord, forgive this person. They don't understand what they're doing. There's a deeper hurt underneath that anger. Don't fight for your natural rights and watch God bless through his supernatural economy. This is true. If you reject the law of the jungle and you walk in the way of Jesus, and you respond with humility and grace and meekness. Just watch. God will bless that type of reaction in a fight. I'm not saying that you sit there and get pummeled and become a pinata full of bees. What I'm saying is that if you will assume the posture of Christ, it is love that overwhelms fear and hurt and heartache. It says over and over in the scriptures that love covers a multitude of sins. Can you love that person? Well, that person is my enemy. Didn't Jesus say to love your enemies? To pray for your enemies? To bless those who are fighting you? See, don't ask God to first change my relationships. First, ask God to change me. Mm. We have an enemy, and it's not the other person. In Ephesians 6, it says that we war against the spiritual powers, the principalities of this world. The enemy is the enemy, and he loves to see disconnects between believers. He wants one Christian to fight against another Christian. 
He loves religious wars. Again, just look at the Middle East right now. That's all the work of the enemy. The enemy will pop up when you least expect it and least deserve it. For example, this week, I was here at the church working. Uh, I was backstage. There's an office back there. And during the week, I usually keep the lights turned off just to save money, you know, save power. So I'll just pull out my cell phone and turn on the flashlight app, you know. Just like when you're at a rock concert, instead of flicking the bit now, we just turn on our cell phones and we wave them in the air. So I do that during the week. I have all the lights off in here. It's dark. And I, I was stepping outside of my uh, office door in the darkness, and, and, and then I kicked something. And I thought it was a kid's toy, like a rubber toy or something. So I whipped out my smartphone and filmed it. You want to see what I saw? If you're squeamish, you may want to close your eyes. Watch this. Okay, y'all. Um, I had the lights off because I was just was saving energy, and I walked out my door, and it was dark, and I felt something nudge my foot, and I, I thought it was like a rubber or something, and I looked down, and this is what I found. It's a freaking snake. I'm about to quote some Bible here and crush the heel of the serpent. Look at that thing. That really happened this week. I was by myself. I might have shrieked a little. I may have had to change my underwear afterward. I don't know. It was pretty crazy. Hey, you see how you're doing in a very dark building by yourself and something goes against your foot. So um, the good news is the snake is still loose somewhere. So if you happen to see it later, just let me know. Listen. We want to make things better in the relationship. And we know deep down that we ought to make things better in the relationship. We just don't know how to make things better in the relationship. Today, all I want to hammer home is the idea of meekness and humility. Humility is putting someone else first. I don't care if that person at work you disagree with is Dwight Schrute himself. You need to get yourself into a place in your head and in your spirit where you put their needs ahead of your own. Remember what we talked about in Ephesians 5 two weeks ago? Ephesians 5, 21 says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the secret to marriage right there. It's when one sinner submits to another sinner, and they submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. Humility and meekness is how you are going to reconcile a relationship. That's the goal. The goal is reconciliation and having no regrets about the situation. The goal is reconciliation and having no regrets about the situation. You don't want to get to the end of your life, be on your deathbed, and look back on a trail of broken relationships that could have been salvaged. Relationships that went on life support because somebody misheard or misunderstood something. You want to pursue reconciliation and no regrets about the situation. We even have a verse, Romans 12, verse 18. The Apostle Paul said, if it is possible, and I'm here to tell you, it is possible, as long as there's oxygen in your lungs and there's a beat in your wrist, it's possible. You have a smartphone device. You can reach out to that person. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, we can't change the other person. We can't force the other person to turn around, to listen, to repent. But you do have yourself. And as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. 
So what this means is that in our broken relationships, in our disagreements, we want to approach with a spirit of humility and meekness, strength under control, and say, I will get back to the person, not back at the person. I will get back to the person. We haven't talked in months. We haven't talked in years. I will not get back at them. I'll give you an example. Uh, this is over a decade ago. Uh, we were leading a church in Ohio because they need Jesus. And we had our best friends, Matt and Emily. They were doing ministry with us side by side. They helped us start a church from scratch, which is an impossibly hard, hard thing to do. It's nothing and turn it into something. And after a year and a half of this church startup, they stopped coming to church, which was really weird because we had sacrificed for the church. We had poured our hearts into this, you know, sacrificed time and money and sweat and tears. And these are our best friends. We're doing life together. So I call them up and uh, my buddy Matt answers the phone. He says, we're not coming back. I'm like, what? What's going on? We don't want to talk to you anymore. And he hangs up. So I'm like, well, we're going to go to their house. And they live 45 minutes away. This was on a Sunday after preaching. And uh, studies will tell you that preaching in front of an audience is like four hours of hard labor because of all of the different chemicals that go through your body while you're doing public speaking. So we jump in the car. We drive 45 minutes to their house. It's me, my wife, and then our then two-year-old son. And we show up, ding dong, ring the doorbell. Matt answers the door and he says, no, 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 this isn't going to happen. I said, well, wait a second. Can we talk? I don't even know what's going on. By the way, I just give you a key piece of advice. If you ever get to a disagreement at your church, um, almost 100% of the time, if you're angry about something with the pastor, the pastor has no idea. Almost 100% of the time, they have no idea. You know why? Because they're not the Pope. They're not perfect. They'll make mistakes. And they will not even know unless you tell them, right? So I go, I don't know what you're upset about. Help me understand what you're upset about. And so he pushes me out into the front yard. They won't let us in the house. And he starts yelling at me, screaming at me. Neighbors are looking out their windows uh, about every little nitpicky thing that he doesn't like about my character or about, you know, me. And uh, my wife is crying. My two-year-old is running around in the front yard. And then his wife, Emily, comes out, and she picks up on him, yelling and accusing and being angry. And, and all that anger is obviously trying to numb a deeper hurt. But we couldn't get to that deeper hurt together because they kicked us out of their lives. Said, we never want to see you again. We never want to speak to you again. And so Amber and I said, we will always leave the welcome mat out for you. We will always be willing to answer any phone call from you, answer any text, to meet you anywhere, anytime, because we believe in this relationship. And they said, no, this relationship is dead. And that was over 10 years ago. Did that hurt me? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, that hurt deeply. Has that relationship been reconciled? No, it hasn't. And yet, Amber and I pray for Matt and Emily. Amber and I continue, about once a year, I'll reach out to them. We'll talk about this more next week, but I'll put out a bid, an emotional bid to them through email. And I'll say, hey, if you ever want to talk, let me know. I love you guys. Because the goal is, I will get back to you, not get back at you. To get back at someone, that's the law of the jungle. That's the way of the world. That's satanic. It's evil. To get back to someone, well, now you're talking Jesus. Now you're talking holiness. We all know John 3.16. You'll watch the football game later. Someone's going to be holding up a sign in the stands. John 3.16, for God to love the world, he gave his only begotten son. The next verse is John 3, 17, which says, for God did not send his son into the world to <laughs> condemn the world, but to rescue, to save, to restore the world through him. He had to sacrifice himself to restore the relationship. 
It's not about payback. It's about getting back. That's the attitude we want to have if we're going to restore broken relationships. It's not about payback. It's about getting back. The Apostle Paul put it best in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19. He said, At all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the assignment of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Not payback, but getting back. And it starts with me. Do I have the right heart and spirit? Am I willing to approach the situation humbly, with strength that's under control, meekness, and honor God through my words and actions? We'll go into part two next Sunday. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, many of us have broken hearts today as we look at the landscape of our relationships. We desire for change to occur in our lives, but change must first occur in our hearts. Lord, would you teach us to be humble? Would you help us embrace meekness this week in our lives and in our relationships? That we might begin to restore that which was broken and taken from us and to see a miracle in our own lives. God, bring us back again safely together next Sunday as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.